All right. So uh, this episode is with um, Edward Miskey from Manhattan. Yeah, really well-spoken man. Very, I loved his heart. And it's really clear that he's just driven to write and perform. And he's also got this element of um, quiet humility, and yet he's not reserved. He's, you know, he's, he's totally willing to share his brilliance. Yeah. But he he's also not pompous or egocentric, and I loved that about him. I agree, and um, we I guess we should have a trigger warning because you you're going to hear a word used by him and I. At, um, and me, did you use it too? Okay. Oh yeah, I'm probably <laughs> the one that's the the most offensive use of this word. So um, feel free to uh, write us at the host at Moped Outlaws and let us know about your experience. And here we go. Sis, hello? Levin, 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 Levin. Please do Zicher Vegan them. Yo, it's in the top. See, Jack, you bins up. I'm in the city. Two outlaws on the lamb, taking the back roads through America. You can't drink enough coffee for this show. <laughs> and now it's time for Monday Madness with the Moped Outlaws, Greg and Mark. And we're live with another episode of Moped Outlaws, co-hosted with my brother, Mark. And today we have special guest, Edward Miski. Am I pronouncing your last name? You correctly? nailed it. Gosh, darn it. And you're hey, by the way, a... you can swear on this episode, even though I... Oh, swear. thank fuck. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And you're coming to us all the way from New York City, right? Yeah, I'm in New York. Dang, good thing you're not here. Still alive. Oh my god, I know. I saw the videos from that last night. Holy shit. Yeah. Ooh. There's a wow. friend of mine that's in Honolulu and she had video from Honolulu looking at the island and she just said we need your prayers. It's pretty rare that Hawaii is asking for prayers. I mean, it's so wild. Like, you know, my friend Bobby and I were talking about this the other night. Like, the, I, th I, I would assume, because I also live on an island, I'm on Manhattan, that like one of the perks of being surrounded by water is that you don't burn to death. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and, um, you know, that wasn't really on the bingo card, I think, for, for 2023. <laughs> but fuck, I uh, mean, Hawaii of all places, man. Like, you'd think that that, that like the rainforesty tropical situation would at least mitigate some of that. But good Lord, those videos were apocalyptic. Yeah, I well, heard that. Interesting the because those it is rainforesty there, right? Right. And it just like with the California fires, what started the fire was a fallen power line. So it's really? not it's not the landscape being dry; it's the power line falling down. Well, here's an interesting thing because on the Big Island, when I was there, there is a there are a lot of dry areas, so it's not all tropical. But I also heard the Coast Guard was pulling people out of the ocean because they had nowhere to go. The fire was forcing them into the ocean. That's so awful. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. I mean, it's do we even still use power lines? Like, can, like, aren't we beyond that by now? Like, take them down. <laughs> Watch pg and E's going to shut us off right now. <laughs> <laughs> so with LK-99, that new superconductor thing that they're trying to make happen in South Korea, we might be able to change that. But uh, we're a few years off from getting rid of all the power lines. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, like, I would think with just, like, fiber optics, which I believe are underground, and then, like, with solar, which is kind of, like, direct to source kind of thing, like... Why are power lines still here? Like, just chop, chop them down like the payphones. We don't use them. Like, get, like, get rid of them. We're right, heading there, Edward. I'll meet you in uh, Wisconsin, the Outlands there, and you and I can just start digging some trenches and getting Great. there. Great. Let's do it. Living in, living in a hole in the ground. <laughs> all right. All right. Hey, speaking of um, dramatic elements of life, you have a book out about surviving cancer about dramatic elements of life yeah i do um it's been quite a quite a wild ride needless to say i mean that whole chapter of my life is well in the rear view that was 10 years ago that i had cancer over 10 years ago that i had cancer now but um the book has kind of taken on a, on a, on a life of its own recently um i had it published in in the fall of 2022, which felt great because it was right before my cancer birthday and my actual birthday, uh, you know, which are two days apart. And, uh, 
yeah that was also there's so so many things that happened that were like are you fucking kidding me but um so the book was published and i hired a publicist and ever since then it's just been like kind of a non-stop like once a month something big would happen like i had an article on in insider i was on abc like i had a bunch of other things happen um you know press wise and and now it's being adapted for tv so it like you wow. know stri strike strike sag after strike with standing and all of the things that are going on with that um you know of course like we're working in solidarity with the <clears throat> with the parameters in which the union is saying that we can work but it's just been such a weird like it's it's not even been a year you know that this is what kind of all happened it's like what what is this life that i'm living now versus last year it's so, so is this an instance, instance where you're going to be able to play yourself in a in a tv show that would have been my want a couple years ago but that's actually not how i'm pitching it now um, I have someone. I have someone who's a, who's a friend of mine. I've worked with them before, and I think they're brilliant. And they look closer to the way that I would have at the age of twenty five, because I think it's more interesting to talk about someone who's twenty five who has cancer in like the upswing of their life versus someone who's closer to my age. You know, even though it's the same kind of like sad feeling, it's like, oh my god, you were only twenty four, twenty five when this happened to you. And uh, so I've kind of decided on uh, the kind of illusion that I'm going to be playing all of the major doctors. So anytime there's a doctor, I'm it. And You're we'll playing just all of them? All of them. So we'll just throw a wig on or something. And call it You're a like day. Eddie Murphy of your cancer story. Exactly, exactly. We're going to nutty professor it. But, uh... We're going to have one with a goatee, one with a mustache, one clean shaven, right. and one with a full beard. And you better not screw up the order of the shots. No, I know, right? Well, I mean, we're, listen, we, I, I would be I would be uh, remiss to say that I'm going to have to have one of them in like a mini skirt and a big wig of some kind. <laughs> Uh, cause my, I mean, and I only say that not because, you know, uh, like the, the trick of it, but, um, my main oncologist who was the one who ended up saving my life was this fantastic, she was like four foot, nothing. She was so short, wow. um, and so tiny, but she was in like six inch heels and a mini skirt and she had like arm cuffs and like, she was dressed to kill every single day. Um, and so it would be a, a, just a sure honor to play her. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. That is so funny. Yeah. So that's kind of the vehicle we're using for that now. But, you know, it's still very much in the works and that's a hundred steps ahead. But that's well, that's me not wanting to play myself in this circumstance. Let me ask you, so you say this um, woman, in essence, saved your life. What was her energy? Like, what was she about in your day to day that, entered your life that was the healing energy she scared the shit out of me um you know i'm six four she came up to my chest on a good day like with the heels on and um anytime i saw her it was always bad news or she was yelling at me for something because i was a horribly irresponsible patient like i drank my way through chemo i was like fucking my way through chemo and like doing all the things i should not have been doing for the betterment of myself you know and we can kind of dive into that and be like why were you that's alternative medicine man that's the, alternative. Alternative medicine. <laughs> um but in the log probably shouldn't have been doing but you know i i hear you um and, you know, she came into my room once um, after I had gone to Florida to visit my sister and I went and swam in the ocean with absolutely no immune system whatsoever in the middle of radiation and came back with a parasite that almost killed me. And she came into my room and she was like, what the fuck is wrong with you? She's like, when this is all over, you're going to need a ton of therapy. And I was like, yeah, OK. All right. Well, I'm as if you weren't going to need cause... therapy anyway. Exactly. <laughs> like, all right. Well, if I'm going to need therapy anyway, I might as well enjoy getting it so was there ever a point where she said to you look edward if you want to kill yourself go for it i'm done if you want to live i'm here like was there an ever a come to jesus moment where she insisted on changing your habits no not from her i mean I, knowing her as a person i don't think she would have ever said that um I think we, I, I like to think that we had a special relationship that could be made up in my head entirely, but I, I was very curious in her position, um, you know, dealing with cancer every day, dealing with dying every day and like her, the one being in charge, if that person does in fact not make it, like, how do you deal with that? And that was one of the first things I asked her and, um, <clears throat> she kind of gave me this look that was like, I kind of got the sense that no one really had asked her that before. Um, 
And she just kind of told me very matter-of-factly that she puts every patient in a little box in her head and files it away, and then she deals with it later. And I just kind of smiled at her, and I was like, do you have time to deal with it later? And she was like, no. And then she left the room. And I was like, oh. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's going to be um, an interesting retirement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, she, I, she does not strike me as the type of woman that would re retire right. ever. Um, right. But she, I, I was genuinely afraid of her. And it took me until a couple years after I was cancer free, still seeing her for follow up appointments where I actually get, kind of felt like a friendship wow. in a sense. That's wild. She tried to she tried to set me up with someone, <laughs> and uh, That's sweet. We, ne we the date never happened, but she tried. <laughs> awesome. One time, she was like, "How do you feel about being Jewish?" I was like, "I I don't have an opinion," and she was like, "Because I have this guy, he's really hot, but he's a rabbi, and you'd have to convert." It's like, oh my god, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> hey, that's a curious thing. Quick left turn. What is Judaism's overall outlook on homosexuality and? I think it depends on the sect in which you're talking about. Orthodox, obviously, is a little bit more conservative in that sense. But the more reformed, modern Jews don't care. My best friend is Jewish. And most, I mean, being in New York, a lot of my friends are. And nobody nobody gives a shit. Is there anything in the Old Testament that's specific about it? Um, I mean, not that I'm aware of. I was raised Catholic, so people always like to try and point... <laughs> point that yeah. finger but i also don't give a fuck i'm not terribly religious to be honest like i've i've maneuvered through a lot of them and i just am put off by all of them and so i don't deal with any of them so that brings up a question for me of you tried them out like you ch you explored it which says to me there's some sort of sense of something greater than us some kind of spiritual uh, hope or ideal in you but it hasn't found a home in any of the institutions is that an accurate description of how you view spirituality I, I I think I've kind of left the realm of being curious about organized religion. I don't really care. I find most of them to be pretty abhorrent in their overall act and messaging and the way that the people within those institutions behave. So I'm more interested in the people who are like, you know what? I don't know, but I'm like curious about learning everything. And so like, you know, we, that kind of leads into the reincarnation conversation that kind of leads into the timeline and alternative life conversation. And then that kind of leads into like this higher source energy kind of life. And, you know, I, I, I think I equal parts believe in all of it and none of it at the same time. Cause it's like, it, it's kind of like with things that are larger than us. Like I think like the government is a good example in any, in any kind of form, like we're never going to know really anything. And so it's kind of like, cool, I'm just going to live my life and I'll, I'll vote when I need to vote. And the rest of it, I don't fucking care. Cause what, what am I singularly truly actually going to do about it. And I think that that is my attitude towards religion too. Like if it's real, great. If it's not, I don't care. I lived my life the way I wanted to. I wasn't a cunt. And so therefore like I'm happy with it. And that's in the end is all that matters. Yeah. That sounds like a value system. Love. Right. Right. Like, like that, that's kind of, I used to joke around a lot about <laughs> my attitude towards religion was like, don't be a cunt. <laughs> that's my that's my religious doctrine like as long as you can follow that i think we're good i think we can get along here but I if you're gonna, if you're gonna deviate outside royal of church. that then <laughs> sorry I, I thought i heard that at the british royal church oh yeah yeah, yeah. that was, that was mass, mass on sunday <laughs> oh lord let me not be a cunt and forgive right that's the, for that's the commandments am. commandments one through ten can really yeah. be summarized in don't be a cunt <laughs> yeah podcast title episode maybe <laughs> i think we might be on that zone right now we'll see maybe something more fun and funnier than a cunt will happen although as a heterosexual male that uh, doesn't seem to be much more than fun than a cunt to me <laughs> hey, so we're, I just we jump, if we jump around a lot so were you in manhattan when the pandemic hit the yeah. Pandemic. yeah i never left so i'm talking about the 1918 spanish flu Yes, I, I'm. I'm still here. I never left. Right. Right. <laughs> Edward Dorian Gray. You know, years. years like, yeah. <laughs> and, so I understand that Manhattan was one of the primary areas that really showed that it was a true pandemic. And for me personally, I have this idea in hindsight that it really wasn't a pandemic. The world sort of panicked and jumped into this chaotic realm. In your personal experience. In the heart of Manhattan, the Big Apple, 
Was there a pandemic that was real? Oh my God. Yeah. Okay. Like to think otherwise is to like deny oxygen, you know, like it's, it, it, I remember sitting in my apartment and hearing people screaming their way into ambulances with loved ones. Um, that was, that was a tough, that was a tough realization. Cause like you're in your apartment, you know, and like you hear things and like ambulance, I lived between two major hospitals. And so it was like, you know, you could hear, hear them going around, but you know, I didn't know anyone personally who had died from it. I knew people who were hospitalized, but thankfully none of them passed. Um, but it, it really, and like, then there was also like the job listings that you would see for people to like go work in the freezer trucks that were overflowing with bodily fluids and like spilling out onto the street because there was nowhere to put them. And they were paying a hundred dollars an hour and they paid you in cash your first day under the assumption that you weren't coming back the second day. Yeah. And it was, it was such a mess. And like, you know, all the stories about FedEx trucks full of bodies outside of morgues that went unattended because nobody knew what to do with them. Like all of that happened. Like it was it was really bad. Mm. And um, the energy in the city just shifted. And there were parts of it that I really liked. I'd say the first two months were the were the worst because um, we were just re-navigating and re-trying to figure out how to live. You know, we we're, were just joking around the other day about like how we were washing our mail and our groceries and everything else because <laughs> like nobody knew. We didn't know. And. And, uh, you know, then once, once we kind of got a handle of it and we are like, okay, if we go outside and we have masks on, some of us did the glove thing, you know, and we stay relatively far away from each other, then we're good. And so I was very lucky that I had some of my closest friends living relatively near me. And so we would all meet up at a central point and take a walk together around the neighborhood, um, which is something I'm, I'm to this day very, very grateful for that I had because it got me out of my apartment. I didn't actually physically leave my apartment for about a month. Um, and back then I lived in a much smaller apartment than you see behind me. <laughs> um, but it was, it was very like very life changing in every sense of the word. Like you, everything that you had going for you was gone you know, completely disappeared, you know, jobs, relationships changed. You were like stuck at home and I, I kind of loved it in a way. I know that I'm in the minority here, but I was very, very busy at that point. I'd remember telling one of my friends, like, I'm on a hamster wheel right now. I'm not okay. I do not know how to get off of it. And I don't know what's going to happen to me if I don't. And then like a month later that happened and I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> nobody needs me to be anywhere or is calling me or texting me or needs shit from me. And it was just like, I'm going to put my phone down over here and I'm just not going to look at it and see how long I can go. And I would go days at a time without looking at my phone. And it was wonderful. I got to kind of Apple reset myself um, yeah. within that period of time and really gain control over a lot of parts of my life that I felt like I had lost autonomy for, with. Um, and then eventually I started to get creative and start projects and I was having an absolute ball doing it. And it was just like, yes, the outside was a mess. And we did the whole like seven o'clock, you know, cheering and clapping for essential workers, which was really fun. Um, and like, that's, I'll say New Yorkers, like when we need to pull together as a community, watch the fuck out. Cause we will. And that, that was so fun, like having my window open and sitting by my window and hearing everyone banging their pots and pans. And like, I would take my Bluetooth and shove it out the window and play songs and, and shit. And it was, it was fun. Like there was a lot of it that was really quite charming at the time. Um, despite the fact that it was absolute mayhem in hospitals, absolute mayhem. Yeah. It's really challenging for me to encounter people who mean well, who are kind of into holistic medicine and, and feel like, you know, we, our bodies are super potent and, you know, vitamin D and, you know, eating the right foods and all that is the, is the way who consider the pandemic to be some sort of hoax, some sort of made up story. And to hear your perspective really brings it home that that, that is just so full of shit. And that we that that the world was in a really difficult spot, and it wasn't some kind of thing that was a bullshit lie perpetrated by you know pharmaceutical companies. You know, yeah, they made money, but it you know I, that always irks me when I hear people talk totally. about well, it. In that but way. also, when you live in a capitalistic society that is mostly <clears throat> solely and only capitalism, someone is going to make money somewhere. 
Right. You know, that's just how it is. Sorry. We designed it this way. You voted for that. Like, congratulations. <laughs> um, you know, so then to point the finger at that person and say, you did this. It's like, no, they were just in the right place at the right time. Why don't you go create something that everyone needs? And then we'll right. go point the finger at you and see how you feel. Um, you know, but I, I loved, I'm a history person. So I love to point the finger at history to be like, how could this possibly be some kind of ridiculous conspiracy theory when we have examples of this already? You know, you mentioned the 1918 pandemic we have that there have been others the bubonic plague went for like 400 years there are still reported cases of it to this day you know it's not on mass because we've built up like an immunity to it for hundreds of years but when that shit first came out that killed a third of europe yeah. a third we we didn't even get that far with covid right. so like that and that was before we knew what germs were <laughs> And yeah. quarant quarantining was actually invented around that time. They used to quarantine sailors on ships in play in ports of call when um, there was an outbreak or, or to make sure if there wasn't an outbreak that they weren't bringing it to that place. So like we can point hundreds of years back and see examples of this. And then to have people in modern day be like, this is made up. Everyone's making, it's like, come on, man. Like we can, it, it, like if you believe in that part of history, then you also have to believe now <laughs> like the truth well, is and, so much more to, boring <laughs> and to be fair there are some really colonized parts of history we are absolutely out. absolutely right Completely but not true. in this case i don't think that's the case in this case and um well i would also say that it would be very difficult to um skew something as historically monumental as killing a right. third of a population of a con of a continent you know like that's pretty to me cut and dry like either a third of these people died or you're making it up and there is no gray area there <laughs> with right. what you were talking about like yes there are things that have been omitted for the greater quote unquote conversation the greater good of the conversation when really like we just weren't taught for a reason yeah yeah. And we're still learning. We're still learning these things. Yeah. That, For a white supremacist reason. Yeah. <laughs> that part. <laughs> so, so let me ask you, so, um, you have identified your uh, identification with gender in your little thing there with your name. So I imagine that you uh, s support the conversation about gender fluidity and identification. Absolutely. D in your personal experience, as a homosexual, has that given you an empathy that you think me as a straight male has had to work a little harder at to reach an empathetic? Yeah, well, I mean, I think this, I mean, that's a big question, right? So I think that unless you have first and or second hand experience to anything within that conversation, it's really hard to wrap your head around it, right? Like we were just talking about like not learning parts of history. Yeah. However, our like black and brown brothers and sisters are very well aware of this history because it's their lived experience. We didn't know it because we weren't taught it because guess what? You know, we didn't Capital. have that lived experience and we weren't <laughs> we weren't given that information and i think a lot of what you're what you're asking is the same kind of thing unless you are around people who have um identified outside of the binary you're not going to have the same kind of empathy as someone like me who maneuvers among those people all the time and i again will tie this back to the conversation we had before about religion and politics i don't give a shit if if that's how you want to live your life then i don't care it doesn't affect me at all how you identify yourself and how you dress and how you behave does absolutely nothing for the betterment or, or worsening of my life. So like, just, just live it, like do it, live your truth because it is so much better to be authentic to yourself than it is to not be for the sake of other people. Um, I know of several, and I'm sure there are thousands other um, cases of men specifically in the earlier part of the century who were not living their true lives and they died having never lived a single day in the skin that they should have been in or that did, they wanted to be in. Did you know anyone personally? That I did and I can't talk about it unfortunately because it's- a No, thing. I understand, but, but you did but have did, personal- yeah. Wow, that's pretty heavy. So you saw personally the pain of someone 
not able to live their authentic truth. Well, and I mean, to be honest, myself included, you know, I grew up in central Pennsylvania. It is ultra conservative. I went to Catholic school my whole life. And, you know, up until the 10th grade, I was hiding, you know, and those are formative years. And if your formative years are spent learning how to hide and navigate by not being yourself, what do you think that does to someone in the long term? And then when I finally did come out because I was forced out by my fucking religion teacher, she's like, really? Oh, speaking of cons. Wow. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Um, (laughs) The abridged abridged version of this story is that a friend of mine who I knew from the college down the road, who was in this like LGBTQ group in within the college that I would go to, um, I had a lot of older friends. And so they would take me along and and take me under their wing in a sense, um, was killed in a car accident. And I didn't know how to deal with it because it was my first like queer person I knew who was a friend that I was close to and their circle of friends that had passed and I didn't know how to handle it. And so I was like in my, you know, indoctrinated teenage brain, like, how do I deal with grief? Okay. I'll call the religion teacher. She'll know. Um, and I was friends with her daughter. So it was less weird. And basically I went over to her house on her invitation and she essentially told me that God took him away before he could enter into a sinful relationship with me because we were both gay. So it was my fault that he was killed in a car accident. So that's, that's, that's how that went. And then the following Monday, she told my class to pray for me because I was struggling with homosexuality. Ooh, brilliant. Um, and, and no one asked her to do that. So <laughs> sounds like she was struggling with what real Christianity really. She she's had a struggle a lot of her life, and we won't get into it because she well, God bless her. her may but... she find the healing that's necessary for her to arrive in a good place. Of, of or, or may love. she not. Or may she not. I don't care. Yeah, if she another. doesn't, if she doesn't, God. She doesn't. God. She embodies so, one of my favorite stand-up jokes I ever heard. That you notice how the word "cunt," whenever you say it, once someone, one of them appears. <laughs> I just <laughs> <butchered> that. <laughs> like Beetlejuice. Um, yeah. Oh dear, yeah, so, we might get bumped from Apple for this one. <laughs> that's okay. <Nah. laughs> no, we um, have explicit listed listed on our site. Yeah, so yeah. Well, I was gonna say that's what YouTube is for. Um, <laughs> but so so then maneuvering through that area, that that coming out, albeit forced, was the first time that I was able to really like draw oxygen in as the person that I was that I was, and that has happened a number of times throughout my life. One of which was you know I work in entertainment, being in theater like up into a certain recent past um you know you were always told to butch it up you know butch it up you can't you can't present as gay you have to be reasonably arguably straight to book roles Hmm. and so i learned how to do that and i spent a very very large part of my 20s um auditioning as a straight person and like even though everyone knew and i wasn't and i was not like trying to hide who i was outside of that professionally speaking i had to pass as being a straight person. And so like that was well up into my thirties that I was doing that. And so uh, really up in uh, one of the other good parts about the pandemic too, was not just getting off this hamster wheel and getting to reset. It was coming to terms in the realization that like, I don't know who I am. I've never been just me. The last time I was like, quote unquote, just me was in the 10th grade. And then I came into the city, maybe the first couple of years that I lived here, sure, I got to live authentically as myself. But beyond that, because of my chosen profession, like I was kind of beat down into like, you know, a little square that I could fit into like little blocks that they wanted me to fit in. Yeah, that's and you don't mean the roles that you mean that the idea of being someone who's trying to make their way in the entertainment field has to kind of a, a game to hide their reality. Otherwise, they're not going to get picked at auditions because of the problematic nature of those situations. Yeah, yeah, essentially, um, yes, and and that has that has changed a lot in the last couple of years. Um, however, you know. Th- I, if I went into an audition going for like the role of Judd in Oklahoma, I don't know how familiar you guys are with musical theater, but like I've seen like, Oklahoma. Yeah. So he's like the brooding bad guy who's like trying to get Lori and he like assaults her and everything like whatever. It's a whole mess. But if I'd go in there not presenting as like a straight gruff bully, I'm not getting that part. Yeah. Because they don't, they can't separate your audition and the and the from who you are they want to see you as that person yeah well, 
have you ever lack of imagination? <laughs> yeah. Have you, have you ever attempted to have the character you're going to be portraying like a light switch where you can go in as yourself and you know they ask who you are, how you're doing, blah blah blah, and then you start your audition. Oh yeah. Flip the switch and yeah. So is that oh, yeah. working? I was for a you fucking days? master at that. Okay. So so that's plausible in life it is it just didn't it didn't feel good and it never did and i didn't realize it because i was so used to doing it and so you know now i don't want to do it anymore it's too hard to go back so do you think you're looking for roles that are closer to your authentic self i'm not looking for roles i'm making them all right that's what you're like that's what this tv show yeah that's and it's, you, it's not the only script I've written. I mean, the book is just the thing that I want to lead with because it means the most to me. But I have, you know, half a dozen other scripts that I could put myself into tomorrow that would not require me to do that. And I could just act the role that I want to do. And if it is, in fact, a straight role, like which most of them I've written for myself or not, um, <laughs> I could do it. But like right. where, where I stand right now, I don't want to. It just doesn't feel good. So do you have any card in the argument of... An actor needs to be like, for instance, um, Brokeback Mountain. Should they have hired two homosexual men to play those roles? Or is there an element that as an actor, we develop character and that should be the authenticity of the professionalism of that individual? I love this conversation. <laughs> so I, there's so many answers to this, right? Like, Brokeback Mountain is a great example, except for the time period that we were in, because that movie was innovative and groundbreaking because there was no conversation about having a gay romantic movie happening at all. And I think that had they actually hired an out gay actor, which at that time there were few and far between and pro and may not have even been willing to do it, um, that the movie wouldn't have been a hit. And so then to see these gorgeous men you know Heath Ledger rest in peace god what a fucking loss that was um and Jake Gyllenhaal playing these roles I mean that that broke so many barriers because you're seeing these presumably two heterosexual at least not if not bisexual men playing these roles that were so in love and just had such a visceral connection that it was undeniably like this energy that you could feel watching it and that really, to me, is the catalyst in cinema where it started to be okay to insert a gay character here and there. Now, if we get into the stereotypicalness of it and the tropiness of it, that's problematic in and of itself for different reasons. But I do think there's something to be said for allowing someone to embody a role. And when it comes down to it, I think the best person should take the job. And for me, it doesn't matter. Um, there are obviously circumstances in which it does matter. Like, I'm not going to be like, I'm a great actor. I'm going to play a black slave. Like that <laughs> is just not something that anyone should do. <laughs> right. Um, but when it comes down to something like gender identity, you know, I think the trans conversation within cinema is a very interesting one because I don't think that that is one of them that we should touch and allow, allow non-trans people to play those roles because that is an experience we will never understand and no amount of research and, and anything else is going to be able to do that justice. Justice. But, you know, I do think that it gets a little, a little out of control because like, otherwise, what is acting if you're just showing up as yourself? Well, that that's what's so important here in this discussion is that being an actor should involve or actress, let's use actor as a non gendered term should involve the ability to, to be beyond self. Right. And the, the real underlying issue, the subtext here is that it's not an a level playing field for people who identify uh, on this spectrum in any way for them to become available to be actors in varying situations. So as a, a gay or bi man, Edward, you should be able to play whatever role you want as a professional and have it not be necessary for you to identify one way or another for that role. But we aren't there yet. We, well, I, would, the I would also, I would also point out we're getting there. We're getting there. But I would also point out that beyond the 
specificities of needing to cast a person who is living that life experience. A lot of times when we're talking about that, it's for people who don't necessarily get the opportunity to have those roles in the first place. So then to cast someone who isn't even remotely close to that in that role is kind of a slap in the face for like they <laughs> this was a little right. bit of, of i will laugh at this and i'm, I'm probably going to get shit for it but like hugh grant just played an oompa loompa in something in like the timothy chalamet like wonka movie that they're putting out oh, and wow. they were like they were they're like so many like little people who are actors like why wouldn't you just hire one of them to play that role mm -hmm. and so like that kind of becomes the the back and forth of it all they shrunk him on screen and like whatever so <sighs> It, yeah, for it, what they paid in special effects, they could have hired. They could have hired. Oh, exactly. And and like I don't want to get too in the weeds with it because I don't have those lived experiences and I can't speak to how those people, um, of any of the people we're talking about, think and feel about this. I I'm just speaking from my perspective of like this is how I view it, and I would really love to live in a world where it didn't matter and we were just honoring people in the best and most authentic way we could with the exceptions and stipulations of like skin color and or a particular gender identity sanity i i, I would not i would even say just i want to live in a world where any it's all plausible like if i'm doing the eddie murphy story and either one of you two can play Eddie Murphy. I want to hire you. If you're the never, best. I would never accept that job ever. Okay, but that's your personal choice. But my point is that the elements of pain that make that uh, unreasonable ask are the elements that I'm hoping are healed. I agree with you in every in most examples except for that one because what we're talking about now then is blackface and that ties back to minstrel shows which ties back to slavery which ties back to like all the problematic shit that has gotten us to where we are now and i would i would absolutely without hesitation say that that would be a terrible idea it would not be received well and someone would burn your house down but, right it's idealistic and and i get the idealism of it but the pragmatism of it still leads to more pain and suffering suffering for people of color and we have to be really careful about right it. now yeah. yeah but that's what i'm hoping is that the healing is so profound that that is no that that is a minor note in the whole big orchestra yeah, well, of humanity. when we get to the star trek timeline that will be the <laughs> well, truth I, well, again, again being a history person i would say that as idyllic as that may be for some people that is then also negating the entire history before that moment yeah and then I, to and then to not honor what has happened and to not acknowledge what has happened by placing a white person in a black person's role <laughs> is just like that's a no that that's that's yep. the opposite of equity yep well i i absolutely hear you guys and the fact that i learned about the um tulsa oklahoma slaughter a couple of years ago in that hbo series um hp lovecraft our lovecraft country yeah i didn't even know that was real like i saw well, I that opening that. and i thought whoa what a dramatic opening and then I learned, oh, that was a real historical thing. So I, I hear you both. So there's the hope that, you know. I, I would just kind of point to the way that people reacted to there being a woman of color playing the role of Ariel in The Little Mermaid. And then magnify that by a thousand if all of a sudden you cast the color purple with all white people. <laughs> oh, God. Please, no. Um, anyway, I think this is a really fruitful discussion. And okay, one, one I want to kind of turn left and start to get back. Okay, before, that's okay. before we turn, <laughs> and Mark <laughs> has some presentation material. We well, no, I just want to make sure that we really f get into the depth of, like, Edward, your part. You know, you're a polymath. You're a singer, a writer, an actor. You're a marketer. Like, we're talking with someone who's got a lot of depth. And I just want to make sure that we don't miss the opportunity to to reach and, and share that with the audience. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Let's turn. 
All right, um, beautiful. We don't, so, we don't need to harp on this topic anymore. <laughs> so, right, it, what I understand that currently, Edward, you're working for the Chelsea Symphony. Is that correct? Yeah, they're one of one of many. They're just my favorite. Um, the Chelsea Symphony is a nonprofit organization in the city. It's an orchestra, and they a symphony orchestra um, that has like really fun programming, innovative programming throughout the year. And I just kind of like lightly do their marketing, social media, and PR. Yeah, and one of the things that you might even have come up with this, they call themselves a daring orchestral experience. What makes them a daring orchestral experience? I did not come up with that. Um, yeah. They've been around for 18 years. I just recently came on in the spring. <laughs> Got it. Um, they, they do pur very purposefully try to uh, round out their programming by, uh, like, I'm trying to think how to... They they try to showcase new works as much as possible. Yeah. And so I think the daring part is not like, oh my God, they like, you know, are playing a symphony while riding motorcycles off of a cliff. Like it's not, right. not, that not kind circus of daring. daring. But yeah. it's it's when you look at the more uh larger landscape of the fine arts and you see what they're doing. The Chelsea Symphony is is kind of deviating from the let's keep doing Mozart and Rachmaninoff and, and all the other things. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but they try to be more innovative with the uh, more modern day composers that they work with. Did they ever take on, I forget the the gentleman's name, but that piece where it's like a sustained note for days, it's the lawnest orchestrated. I mean, we have to get butts in the seats and keep them there. If it goes for Gosh. days, then like, I don't well, know. There is an happen. element of like, if it's an open door, you come in, you watch part of it. Oh, maybe. like a performance art piece. Yeah, that, I mean, that could be cool. I don't know. Yeah. Well, and, and I can just see oboe players playing the note, right? And then someone comes in and sits next to them, picks up and the note, and the over, oboe yeah. player can take a breath. Right. Well, <laughs> well, then you get into like the circular breathing conversation, and like oh, there's God. only a small percentage of people who can do that. <laughs> have they ever done any performance um, partnerships like with yeah. a performance artists? And yeah, we just did. Um, we just did a concert in Prospect Park in Brooklyn with this woman named Lady Jess. She plays in the orchestra in, at Sweeney Todd on Broadway. She's done a bunch of other things as well, but she's toured with Beyonce and she's done a bunch of shit. She's fucking cool. And that was a huge success, huge success. Wow. So she what kind of uh, she kind of oh God, it was end of end of july end of july so it just just recently happened but they played in the lena horn band shell in prospect park and the chelsea symphony played backup for her and it was incredible she was amazing was, was she singing or was there performance art aspects to it i mean watching her alone was performance art because she's the stunning like black woman and she was just dressed to kill and plays the violin like a motherfucker like she's it, it was it was a great night yeah <laughs> right on right speaking on. of beyonce when i was looking for your album renaissance and google kept trying to take me to beyonce you know when she announced that i was like not beyonce stealing my concept because that came out three years ago beyonce are you ready to get us canceled here we go that cunt i know right i know um and like obviously like there's no real way that she could have seen it and taken it and like i don't have an ownership over the word renaissance or whatever and there's certainly been tons and tons and tons of conversation around you know us going through a global renaissance right after the pandemic and like is it happening now when will it happen is it happening and so you know i just happen to be pre beyonce's renaissance album and how dare she <laughs> yeah and one of the interesting things i found out was in my research for today's conversation was that your cancer tied into the production of that album through an organization called cancer can rock yeah. how did they play a role in the production of renaissance so not directly but like the long short of it is that when I moved to New York right after high school, I wanted to be a pop star, you know, like I've had delusions of Britney Spears and that's what I wanted to do. And so I had recorded like this pop rock album with my dad um, when I was 16 and I moved to the city with it and I was like, I'm going to make shit happen. And, and I did the whole like downtown music scene for a little bit, which was just soul crushing and draining back then. It's probably easier now in a different way, but Oh man. Um, but I gave up on that because it was soul crushing and horrible. And, you know, I got to meet some cool people 
I got to sing with Rachel Platten before she was Rachel Platten, like when she was a little baby before she moved to LA. And I mean, I also was a baby, but, um, <clears throat> you know, it just felt so dishonest because you weren't guaranteed anything. You weren't even guaranteed to be heard, you know, like not that anyone owes me anything, but you know, you go down to the clubs with a track and you're like, Hey, can you play this to the DJ? And you try and make relationships with them back then. It was my space, you know, that you were trying to connect with yeah. D- DJs and shit. And uh, it just was like, they'd look at you like you were a fucking asshole. And at least with theater, like I could show up at a certain time and have some music prepared and get into a room with the people who are making decisions and sing and leave. And even if I didn't booked it, it's like, well, at least I got a chance, right. you know, and that's not, that was not my experience with that. So I really shelved the whole, like, I want to be a walking boy band. I basically George Michael, um, for many, many years. And it wasn't until Jimmy Burt at cancer can rock that I, I was, invited down and we recorded a track that i wrote when i was 19 and it was really trippy and weird and it was fun and i had a really great time is that and fab? all of his no no that's actually called uh walk of shame that was a different that was a different uh project but it's very beatlesy and queen like like tastes of queen in there too and it just kind of unlocked this thing that was like i still have this like i was good back then if this is what this was going to be back then, like I'm, I've got my, I know what I'm doing. So it really kind of unlocked this whole, like everything is so accessible now with digital, you know, like all of those songs that are on, on that album and, and subsequent ones that have followed have all been written on this little tiny little keyboard in front of me. You know, well, it I, seems like Bridgerton missed an opportunity. <clears throat> what do you mean? To use your material. Oh, well, I mean, this was after Bridgerton, but yes, Shonda Rhimes, please call me. <laughs> Damn. Um, so I was, re- I read about Fab and I, one of the things I love about that song is the, the, the critique that's in it. Can you talk oh, a little yeah. bit about that? Wh- which part of the critique? Well, in, in your notes on um, your band camp, you said that you were witnessing people coming in and out of these shops. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Aspect of them was that, you know, there was a, a piece about, the, you know, how their lives seemed hollow to you from the perspective you had then. Yeah, I mean, really, I kind of wrote that song to, like, make fun of them in a way. Um, you know, just these glamorous people that seemed like there was nothing wrong and how they just like wafted about their day because they didn't have to be anywhere. And it was just like, Oh, it's two o'clock time to go shopping again. And, uh, you know, it was just kind of like this idea in my head where I was sort of making fun of them, but also wondering what it'd be like to be them. And, uh, and so it was kind of like a very Rufus Wainwright, Mm. like eye of Rufus Wainwright kind of written piece that was like, I want to talk about these people. But, uh, I, I I guess I wouldn't necessarily call it critique so much as it was an observation. Yeah. That and was my word. Yeah. Yeah. And like I, I critique. Yeah, sure. I mean, I talk about the way that they maneuver and look and dress and, and whatever, but I think it was more so just like they all kind of looked the same, you mm-hmm. know, this was in like the very fresh real housewives of whatever territory. And so it was like, <laughs> all of you are assimilating and I can see it. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, it's both interesting. Go ahead, Greg. It, it occurs to me that um, I have a character of an ultra wealthy person, that they're a shell of a person. And as we were earlier talking about empathy with people of color and people of different gender and sexual persuasions, I imagine that there's an element of empathy that could be called for with the ultra rich that there is a human being there also. Yeah. And I mean, I think this, um, I don't want to jump the gun on, on what you guys want to talk about here, but like, I think that this kind of ties well into the whole, like, Oh, I had cancer conversation because shortly after I was like declared cancer free and I was hanging out with friends and I finally like came out to them about having had it. Cause it was not something that I told people, um, except for my closest friends, people would be like, Oh my God, listen to me complaining to you. Like oh, you just had cancer. Like, like what am I, who, what my problems aren't like, whatever. And to me it was like, 
stop it. Like you yeah. can still talk to me about it. It's fine. Like, it's not like this isn't a competition here. And so it's like, <laughs> everyone's problems are relative to their circumstances. And like, even though you didn't have cancer, this thing that you're talking to me about matters to you. And so I would kind of point that back into the direction of what you're talking about by saying like, yes, the one percenters have a bad rap. They're notoriously terrible people because they didn't get there honestly. And so, you know, you want to kind of vilify them and make them these hollow, horrible people. And in a lot of cases they are, and that's just, it is what it is. But, you know, at the end of the day, the question then becomes, do they go to bed feeling the same, the way that we do? Right. Mm -hmm. Do they still feel things the way that we do? Do they still think about things the way that we do? And I'm, my instinct is to say no, but I don't know that. And I, my instinct is to say yes, because I think there's, <laughs> Again, talking in the grand scheme of the universe, I do believe in an infinite element, an element of infinity. That's love. And I think life has that spark. All created life comes from that same source of infinity, love. So there's, I think, my faith is that we can hide it we can think we can hide it and it doesn't exist, but ultimately we can't kill it off. That spark's going to go on and on in each of us. There's a pop song on and on in each of us. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's something here about when we allow ourselves to judge others with no actual sense of what their life experience is like. We're treading into an area that becomes problematic quickly at whatever level. Like we can make reasonable suppositions about people and it's not reasonable because we don't actually know. And so that it's, there's a laziness there, a kind of empathetic laziness where we want to put people in little boxes based on their classification one way or another. And, and the, the poignant thing, the one we'll all agree around probably has to do with ableism and racism and, you know, those sorts of things. But we actually do it on all, all kinds of lines, you know, unconsciously. And, you know, it's important that we redefine the way our economic system works. And right now, one of the ways people are trying to do that is to vilify and personally attack people who are in the billionaire category. And they're critiquing the people instead of critiquing the process, except for the most cogent arguments, which critique the process and say, look, in order to amass that much wealth, you have had to have paid too little for labor that got you that wealth. And I think that's a really cogent art, you know, argument. I've met a couple billionaires. I worked for one for 20 years. That man was a really great human being and he did some amazing things for humanity and his art is, is well respected by millions of people. So I don't agree that the, the, by definition you're evil, if you happen to be someone who c cultivated that much wealth, but I think it's an important conversation we need to have about how we want to live going forward because well, that's really where we're at. And it's interesting because this person you're mentioning that company is notorious for working people hard and paying very little ultimately for that labor. Well, that's a misnomer. Okay. That's good to hear. Yeah. See, there you go. That's well, and I, that with, story of lack, but without, no without knowing who this is and I don't need to, and you don't have to tell me, and I'm sure you signed something where you actually can't. So like, I'd have to shoot Mark if he said, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but like if, you do have someone who is because not everyone is just one thing, right? Like we all are right. very multifaceted. So someone who is in that billionaire class can be a very nice human being, but then do shit, horrible things to amass and keep wealth and power. Um, <clears throat> and I would like to kind of like, point out one of my favorite theories, which I guess it really isn't a theory, but it's a, psych a psychology theory of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And basically what it says is when your bases are covered, you know, like air, water, food, sleep, shelter, clothing, money, etc. 
when those things are covered and taken care of, you can then move on to the next thing, which is personal security, um, like having a job, resources, health, owning property. And then when those things are taken care of, it, you're more likely to have a healthier relationship with friendship, intimacy, family, etc. And then when all of those things are kind of locked in, you get to the top, topper part, top mo most part of the pyramid, which is self-esteem, respect, status, recognition, and then at the very top, self-actualization, where you can become the best version of yourself that you possibly can. And those who are in the billionaire class automatically have all of those things built in. And so there's nothing for them to do but continue piling on top of that top mm -hmm. point of the pyramid. And like whether that is generationally speaking, whether that is, you know, amassing that kind of money by abhorrent like labor practices or whatever the case may be, they do have a different level of freedom that we all have. And some of us go to bed thinking about where is money coming from next month? You know, how am I going to pay for things? Whereas that's not a thing that crosses their mind right. at all. Yeah. Right. You know, and like whether they're a good, good human being forward facing or otherwise, right. you don't get to that kind of money by being a good human. Right. You get, well, well, that's the know. point of debate yeah, I'm differing on, right? I don't know about that one. Yeah. But again, I mean, I don't know this person. I don't know. But like there, there's the generational wealth conversation as well. There's also like the, the multi-income stream investment and rolling forward, that kind of wealth. There's a lot of different ways you can get there. But for the most part, a lot of these um, multi-billionaire humans get there from exploiting labor. Yes. And I agree with you. That's an important aspect of the problem. And just because I happen to identify with the one exception that we could probably name, we, we don't, it doesn't negate the importance of the, the point of view that you're reminding us of Edward. It is an important factor. And we, what's present here is that Maslow's hierarchy of needs could function at a level where there's bo those bottom parts of the pyramid were the bedrock of society and everybody had them. And we were all standing on top of that. And now we're in a position where people's creativity and insight and innovation and ingenuity could move humanity forward in massive ways. But because there's people who have a vested interest in keeping that struggle for that bottom part of that hierarchy, uh, the most present thing for masses and masses of people, we're not evolving at the level that we could. And I think that sort of speaks to what Greg was talking about, you know, Greg and I are both graduates of something called, well, not graduates, we're students of this thing called the Course in Miracles. And in that, there's the supposition that eventually healing will occur for everyone and that time is irrelevant because we're, that's the process. That's the nature of what it is we're, we're trying to uh, achieve, that, that we're being destined to achieve. And so if we were all to have that kind of leg up, we could evolve spiritually and, and, and mentally and emotionally so much quicker than we are now. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I think that also kind of goes back. Sorry, I wasn't sure if you were done. Um, that, kind of, yeah. that kind of yeah, goes back to, to uh, off there. awkward. No, no, okay. <laughs> um, that kind of like harkens back to the conversation about, you know, universal health care, universal income, like just taking care of the people who fucking live here, who are living under a certain means, you know, I mean, if all of those things were taken care of, think of the innovation we could have, Yeah, you know, but unfortunately it very much feels like the people who are in charge don't want innovation from just everybody. You know, yeah. they, they need people to be starving for jobs so that they can give them the lowest common denominator yeah. Well, here's a, just a spark of an idea that comes to mind. <clears throat> when you were in 10th grade, you had a very painful outing from what you've kind of hinted at without going into details. But ultimately, it was a very healing trajectory of your life because you started to be able to be who you really are. And and what's my point? Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I wonder if, you know, we, I think the three of us as conscious beings would agree change is difficult and change is necessary. We want change in our life. We want to evolve. Perhaps pain is one of the most powerful elements of positive change in one's life. 
and there's a very natural human reaction to pain that is to move away from it. So it's like we have this human um, dilemma of that which will heal us most is that which we're shying away from. I mean, uh, in that example, I would just say that it, it wasn't healing in the sense that I think you're saying it was healing. It was healing in the sense that it forced me to do something I was not ready to do. I did not consent to do. And it was a violation. I just happened to at that point because of what I had happened had to maneuver as up into that point was very good at taking bad situations and making the best of them and living in, in that way has made me very resilient throughout my whole life mm -hmm. and so anytime some shit happens i figure out a way to flip it around to benefit me and so am i grateful that it happened no did good come out of it yes would i have preferred to come out on my own terms yeah that's a very good point. Because like with the end of my marriage, I'm not grateful it happened, but I can see the silver lining to the whole thing. Yeah. And a lot of it is hindsight. You know, I mean, I, right. I talk very frequently in the, about the cancer conversation and cancer, I will always say, and I will die on this hill, that it's the best thing that ever happened to me Wow, because it sucked at the time, but we wouldn't be sitting here if it didn't happen. Wow. And nothing that has happened with this book or anything else would have happened had I not had it. Do you right. think the cancer experience gave you a sense of self and bravery that you are more able to take risks in your life? No, actually, I think that it it uh, completely derailed everything that I wow. thought I knew about myself. Wow. And in a way, like this is this is literally like what the TV series is going to be about. It's about self-identity and discovering yourself. Um, but it really shook everything you know i thought i knew who i was i was this like really young hot like up and coming like in my opinion up and coming <laughs> <laughs> uh kid with like a, a lot of promise for a career in theater and then that got in the way and mm -hmm. i f there was a really really very long time where i felt as if though life had cheated me out of a lot of opportunities that i could have had had that not happened instead i took what happened and made it work for me because so, that's the only way that I know how. Even when I was in the hospital, I started a whole ass company. I was running a magazine out of my hospital room. I was art directing photo shoots from FaceTime and editing shit in my hospital bed. Like, that's just how I function. Um, you know, retirement be damned. I'm never doing it. <laughs> I don't know how. So these um, two elements in your life, being ousted and in 10th grade and getting cancer are things you wouldn't have chosen and you made lemonade out of lemons to yeah i mean essentially to put it to put it in those terms yeah you know and you you kind of have to right like that's life shit's always flying at you and right. and you know i think in in the spiritual world and in the mindset world of things like there's a lot of people saying like oh you have control over absolutely everything and, and it's like <laughs> okay you don't but what you do have control over is how you feel and how you maneuver and how you process things yes and yeah. so cancer for me, like I was furious and just so upset and terrified from day one. And it took me a little bit to adjust and to adapt and to get used to being a full-time patient. But once I was in it, I was like, okay, I think I'm all right. And there was a lot of ups and downs and very touch and go moments where it was like, is this the end? I don't know. Um, but after it was all over and I, I took the years that I needed to take to kind of get back on my feet and recalibrate my brain to be like, this is who you can be as a person. Um, you know, it, it did kind of put me in on the road of the trajectory that I'm on now that I wouldn't trade for anything. Um, this is a very personal question. So you can tell me to fuck off. Ask away. All right. Did you, there's have a chapter a... in my book where I'm getting fucked by the neighborhood. So like, it's like, you know, it's fine. <laughs> Literally. Holy Christ. I did not know that was in your life. <laughs> I mean, not, not far from it. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, consensually. Yeah, you your consensually, you. consensually. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, well, maybe that answers my question, because I was wondering, did you have a lover partnership, a single individual in your life before you were diagnosed with cancer? Like during the, 
when you were diagnosed, was there a lover partner in your life? Oh yeah, there's a whole there's a whole thing with that. Um, I actually cut out a couple chapters about him because I was like, I'm giving you too much space. However, that has been the main conversation on a lot of the press that I've done because people are fascinated by it. So I was with someone when I was first diagnosed and, and before, obviously, and then. Uh, when that ended, it was because I found out that he had been seeing someone else basically since I found out that I had cancer. So he checked out, but he stuck around because he felt as if though that's wow. what I needed. So uh, he, his, his dealing with you being diagnosed with cancer was to start cheating on you because he, in essence, like you just said, checked out. Yeah, we did both apparently, right? Because he did maintain contact with you and and was supportive of your healing process. Meanwhile, he was betraying your uh, expectations of monogamy. Well, there were no expectations of monogamy, but there was an expectation of being there in like a more romantic partnership. We're in this together kind of thing. Got it. Um, and that more so was the betrayal. And wow. it... um. It wasn't great. <laughs> no, clearly. <laughs> but uh, that's a very diplomatic statement. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like Your again, honor, in, it wasn't great. It wasn't great. Um, but in true form, you know, I took that and I created my online magazine because of it. You know, he was six foot ten, and I was like, where am I ever going to meet someone that tall ever again? And wow. so I created an online magazine that was specific for men who were over six foot two. And I was like, all right, here we go. And it ended up not being a dating pool, but being a really great uh, project to work on. I had like gotten brand deals and and all kinds of opportunities through that. And I'm still friends to this day with some of the people that I've, that I connected with through that. So, you know, it was taking a bad situation and making it good. And like, right, so that has no, it seems to be no, a theme here. It's a theme. I hate that it's a theme, but it's what I do. <laughs> I don't know if it's a good or bad thing. <laughs> it's a beautiful example for human beings to witness because what it reminds us of is our own capacity to take that and transmute our experience into something generative. And that's a part of why we love artists is because they, they can weave the fecund aspects of life into something beautiful. They take tragedy or they, you know, and they convert it into art. Yeah. And I, like, you know, I don't know how to do it any other way. Right. And I think right. that there's also maybe a subconscious portion of this maybe that's like that's like i have already given up a lot of my life to cancer um and it has taken up a lot of my brain space and so anything that kind of comes into that realm that i don't want i'm like i don't have to do this hmm. and it really is kind of like taking back the power and autonomy of your own self by being placed in circumstances that you don't want to be in and just instead of ignoring them or trying to push them away grab them and be like no i'm in control of this it's like finding a snake you know you could run away from it but it's going to chase you so you have to grab it by the head and right. like and like kind of take it take it out that way and like chuck it where you need to or whatever you're going to do to it yeah. but like you really do have to kind of take control and grab it and make sure that this is like I'm doing this my way and and I don't fucking care. What was the name of your magazine? It was called There Are Giants. <laughs> I like it. It doesn't like exist it. anymore, but we got some pretty great pretty great. Have you checked out archive.org? It might exist there still. Oh, it might live there. I don't know. I'll have and to look. Why did you decide to close the doors on it? Um, it was a lot of work. And life at that point was going in a different direction. It was very busy. Um, and I just didn't have the, I just didn't have the want to do it anymore. It felt like it had run its course. What sucks is that if I would have stuck with it for another two years, um, it would have absolutely been a main point of conversation within the, like the body positivity and, and mm. big, big man conversation. Um, you know, because it wasn't just plus size guys, it was men of all shapes and sizes. We had a guy who was like, I think six, seven and 140 pounds. And he was just like wow. this tiny little narrow man, Impolite. um, who was always like, <laughs> who never fit into any clothes he ever bought. <laughs> right. This is impossible, <laughs> impossible. But like, but it was fun. We I think there was a certain element of community and helping other people that was present there that just felt good. Yeah. But you created that over and over again now. Yeah. Awesome. Seemingly I have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have, what you have is a, is a solution. 
I think that's probably the better way to look at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Um, Is your family well, supportive of supportive of you? Yeah, they're great. Awesome. We were we were cool before, but then cancer really kind of um really kind of uh glued everyone together. You know, God love my parents. Holy shit. I mean, my little sister went to rehab the year before and then I had cancer the year after Ooh, and it was just like fuck me. Like if they're still going strong, they're going to be just fine. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh yeah. it was a rough time for everybody, but we're good. Awesome. So, I have a couple more things I want to do and then if there's something else, Greg, uh, we have a question that we ask all of our guests right. and you may know the, uh, the question. Okay. You oh, want to okay. do that now or do you want to do well, your- what I'd like to do is ask the question. And then when we're finished with that, after we sort of feel like we've wrapped up the conversation, I would like to play the track Renaissance from your record as the way that we leave the show. How do you feel about okay. that? Edward? I'd feel great about that. Okay, so Greg knows the question I'm going to ask. Is there anything you want to ask before we do this, Greg? Um, yeah, just you said you were raised Catholic and loosely identify with as Jewish now. How'd that happen? Are both your parents Catholic? No, I don't identify as Jewish, actually. Um, my mom's dad, we found out after he died that he was very a little, little very baby part Jewish. Like um, he was half circumcised? <laughs> yeah, they only took half of it. All right, uh, right down the middle, just like All cut right, it in half. Perfect. Little floppy thing, <laughs> like a lid. Um, yeah, no, I, I'm, I the don't. Superhero cape. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, the visual. It's a Hard as a rock. <laughs> it's a bird. It's a plane. It's in my ass. Um, yeah, no, um. I, I guess I'm only kind of Jewish by proxy, you know, like <laughs> not really. Actually, I probably could have qualified to go on the birthright trip, but I didn't try. Okay. Okay. So, all right, that's that. So let's go for our question. This is our go-to question. It's our anchor question. We ask everybody, Foo Fighters or Eminem? Oh, Foo Fighters all the way. Awesome. All like right. queer awakening watching that like the fly video where uh know. david oh, my oh God. Wait, I that, the, where he plays all the characters and he's yes, like the woman the steward is like flirting brilliant. so brilliant and i was like oh my god he looks hot as a woman okay <laughs> yeah and even his mannerisms were so effeminate that was just so like, brilliant oh. Yeah. <laughs> so brilliant. Definitive yeah. moment. <laughs> yeah. All right, all right. That was brilliant. All right. All right. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to put up a still image from your website and we're going to play this song Renaissancing. But before we do that, is there a way people can get a hold of you if they want to hire you to write movies or scripts for them or they want to book you to do an acting audition or have you on their oh, podcast? Yeah. Well, I mean, Instagram. Instagram and TikTok are always the uh, the best bet, which is just at Edward Miskey. And, you know, of course, there's my book. You can get me get me that way. Cancer Musical Theater and Other Chronic Illnesses available anywhere you buy books, including Barnes & Noble. Avoid Amazon. They're terrible. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want to help Jeff Bezos buy another country or something. Yeah, fuck that guy. Um, and, if, and, his, if you... and his penis rocket. <laughs> If you end up liking this song, you can go to Bandcamp and and buy it like we did. Oh. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> there she is. Oh, oh we lost her. Somewhere I like the storm. 
Recording stopped.